Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Hanging on to Hope podcast. I'm Brenda J. And I'm Karen Wonder. And we are HangingOnToHope.org. This podcast is intended as educational and is not psychological or medical advice. Always consult a professional when needed, and we disclaim any liability in connection with the instruction, information, or advice given. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Hanging on to Hope podcast. This is Brenda J. Today, we have Ann Blythe on the podcast. She is a director and founder of Betrayal Trauma Recovery and a podcast host and producer. Betrayal Trauma Recovery is a daily support group with multiple sessions a day in multiple time zones. Betrayal Trauma Recovery also provides a free educational podcast for women needing immediate emotional refuge from the pain and chaos caused by their husband's lying, gaslighting, manipulation, porn use, cheating, infidelity, emotional abuse, and narcissistic traits. After years of attempting to stop her husband's pornography use and anger issues, he was arrested in 2015. Anne educates women on how to safely and effectively navigate their husband's or ex's psychological abuse and sexual coercion, and establish peace in their homes and families. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Brenda. It's so good to be here. Absolutely. Now, I personally experienced betrayal trauma as well. My ex had an affair, affairs, infidelity, porn use, lying, gaslighting, manipulation, cheating, emotional abuse, narcissism. He was a sociopath, domestic violence, spiritual abuse, and verbal and emotional abuse. I also felt betrayal by his mistress, who was one of his cult members that was like a daughter to me. So having you on the podcast is very important to me, not only because of what you say, but also what you represent. Our goal of this podcast is to provide free tools for healing and education. The group coaching resources you offer in your podcast are amazing, and I would have loved to have known about all these resources during my horrific marriage. I know the coaching is not free, but I feel what you offer seems to be invaluable to so many women. Well, hi, this is Karen. So nice to meet you. You too, Karen. So would you mind telling us a little more of your abuse story and how it led up to starting betrayal trauma recovery? Yeah, for years, I understood that my husband was a pornography addict and also just weird anger things were going on. I did not identify it as abuse. There was even physical abuse that I did not identify as physical abuse, more like physical intimidation, uh, like taking a pickaxe to a fence, for example, when he was angry, but not necessarily harming me directly, Mm. punching walls, you know, that sort of thing. So I thought it was all stemming from his pornography addiction. And I thought if he could get to the heart of this pornography addiction thing, then his anger would clear up, right? Like get to the bottom of the issue sort of idea, which I think so many women do. Like it, Mm -hmm. what's the, what's, what are the root, what is the root of his anger problem per se? Mm -hmm. So he became the quote unquote star pornography recovery person. And some people, this is sex addiction recovery. Some people, it might be alcoholism or some other type of addiction. He would go to 12 step groups. He began speaking with me about his amazing recovery. The deeper and deeper that I thought he was getting into pornography addiction recovery was not solving his anger problems. And so then it became like, okay, well, what about these anger things? And that never really resolved. In fact, that started to escalate. I did not understand at the time that he was never, quote unquote, losing control. These anger episodes were always his attempt to assert control in our relationship. And I also did not know that that is what abuse looks like. Mm -hmm. That is emotional and psychological abuse. And I didn't understand that. So because I was the spokesperson for the pornography addiction recovery movement. When he was arrested in 2015 for domestic violence, it finally escalated to physical assault. I went to the domestic violence shelter. I started reading a lot about abuse and I thought, wait a minute, I've been being abused this entire time. And I've been going to therapy. I've been going to clergy. I have been reaching out for help to everyone that I could think of. I've been facing this 
head on. And no one ever said the word abuse. They wow. just kept talking about his addiction and how I could help him and how to be patient and how to be loving or, you know, whatever else. No one ever indicated to me that I was an abuse victim until after his arrest. And the strange thing was at that point, because I had been so outspoken about his pornography use and his anger and everything, my neighborhood, some of my neighbors saw me as the perpetrator because I was the one that called him out. And he was this humble person who was trying to work on his addiction and trying to work on his anger issues. And I just like, wouldn't forgive him or something at that point, because everything had been so public. And all of a sudden I'm calling him abusive and they're like, well, she's been so outspoken about the porn use and stuff. Like, why is she just now saying the word abuse? And the reason is because I didn't know I was being abused. I I didn't understand. So I, at that point, um, I quit all my pornography addiction recovery jobs and work and you know what I would do there. And I just started studying abuse and I realized this is just abuse and I cannot stop now. I can't, I can't just have told this half of the story. I need to tell the rest of the story. And I also, we all need to be educated about abuse so that we don't go for help for years with therapists and clergy and other people, you know, waving our arms, like help us, help us. And we never get the right help. And we're always directed down a wrong path. Like maybe he has a personality disorder, or maybe he's got too much shame or, you know, something like that. Like, it would have been really nice in my case and so many of our cases if we would have been educated right off the bat to say this is psychological abuse, this is emotional abuse, and mm-hmm. I would have been a lot better off and so would all abuse victims if we really knew what we were dealing with. Right. Now, this so reminds me, we interviewed Bob Ham earlier this week and he had done a video like four years ago. He's got a practice called Think Differently and it was on Facebook, but I watched his video and he talked about the dynamics of abuse and that's what our podcast is about. Mm-hmm. And it was so validating because he broke it down and he said, the dynamic of abuse is one person's carrying all the responsibility for the relationship. And the other person wants that. They're like, yeah, go ahead, take the responsibility. I don't want any responsibility. And that's so, it was so validating to me. It clicked, it clicked. Mm-hmm. And I, I just was hearing that when you were describing all that, like he was working on maybe some of his issues a little bit, but he still wasn't carrying the full responsibility of the relationship. It was still on you. Mm-hmm. And then you got validated that, you know, instead of being told no, there's something off here. You know, you you just had more stuff put on you. Uh Uh-huh. Well, and I don't think he was ever working on any of his issues. I think show that he was working on his issues was just a show. And I also think it was grooming. I think all of the times where I thought he was working on it or he seemed compassionate or he seemed to understand it was just a grooming phase. So as I started to I quit everything in pornography addiction. And then I started studying abuse. And then I thought I need to tell the rest of the story. So I started podcasting. And as I was podcasting, you can go to my website, vtr.org and find the podcast from the beginning from 2016. And you can listen to it from the beginning until now. And just my whole demeanor changes in real time. If you listen to it like that, you can hear me like crying and just oh, yeah. you know, frustrated. And then, and then now it's like, I sound healed and I sound uh-huh. healthy. So it's really kind of a awesome, like real time sort of view of like someone mm-hmm. recovering from abuse. But um, uh-huh. in the meantime, people from all over the world were messaging me and saying, Hey, this is my story too. Can you help me? And I, because of all of the women reaching out from all over the world, we evolved and grew into the organization that we are today. We, I now have eight coaches that work at Betrayal Trauma Recovery. We run a daily support group that has multiple sessions a day. And I have a podcast team. And it's just incredible. All of the women who work for Betrayal Trauma Recovery are abuse victims themselves. They have been through it. They understand it. And it's such an amazing organization to be a part of. And the culture is so safe for abuse victims. I mean, it's so needed. Like what validation is such a big part of when you are in that space, you need validation. So that's so awesome that you guys offer that. Yeah. Yeah. So it started out as a podcast and just blew up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool, right? yeah. I, so I, I thought, you know, there wasn't anywhere to send them when people would come and be like, hey, I need help too. This is happening to me too. I couldn't in good conscience send them to their local, you know, porn addiction recovery wife group or something, right? Because I, I had been down that road for so long and I thought I never, no one ever said the word abuse. 
And I can't in good conscience send you to maybe a CSAT who's also not going to say the word abuse. There, there are, I'm not going to say go to couple therapy. They're not going to say the word abuse. So right. it was like, there was nowhere to send anybody. And so we just thought, well, we've got to figure out a way that the community of survivors that we are, right? That we can help each other and bring each other right. up because we really don't need someone who hasn't experienced this, right? To like, quote unquote, like help us out. You know, it would be right. great if they validated <laughs> us and great if they helped us, but they they don't really have anything to tell us. I don't think in terms of like, you know, just you've just got to let it go or something like that, and that might be a good concept, except right. for when they're not coming at it from our experience, a lot of times, perhaps good advice or good counsel is so triggering to women who are traumatized and we cannot process it because essentially it feels like to us, I think that they just don't get it right. They don't understand. And so I think the best help for women who have been traumatized for abuse victims is from other women who have experienced it, who know how to help them process it in a way that is safe right? I think that's the key. Absolutely. That is so true. Yeah, I totally agree with that. So one of our listeners messaged us a while back to address the topic of learning trust again and how to let the walls down that they have put up. I saw you've done a podcast on learning to trust again, and I thought we could address this topic. After listening to it, it was very enlightening to know that you're just starting in your journey of trusting again, too. So this is a great podcast for all of us. I feel it's important to discuss post-betrayal trauma a little bit first because it addresses putting up the walls and what that signifies. So one sign of unhealed post-betrayal trauma in relationships is if someone keeps having repeat betrayals. Another sign is the person that puts up the big wall saying no one is going to get near me. The person is looking at it as strength, but what they're doing is preventing their heart from getting hurt again. Is there anything you wanted to add about repeat betrayals or putting up walls from your experience? And do you find yourself putting up walls? I think that's definitely very, very common. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I do think it's really common. Let's talk first about repeat betrayals. I actually, uh, with all due respect, (laughs) have a a little bit of a problem with saying that it's victim, it's the victim's fault for yet another betrayal, right? When we tell a victim of another betrayal, well, it's your fault because you have unhealed trauma is just another form of victim blaming. I think even a super healthy person could be betrayed multiple times. And I don't think a betrayal is ever a victim's fault. So, so when we talk about unhealed trauma, I think the thing that we really need to focus on is how does the victim feel? How is she feeling now? Is she feeling this big hole that she like really feels like her life is not going to be healthy or that she can't get what she needs without another relationship, right? And I think that that stage of trauma, it might not even be trauma healing. I mean, I think about me as a teenager, right? As a teenager, I thought, oh, I really want a boyfriend. Like I would be cool and people would like me and yada, yada, if I had a boyfriend, right? Mm. So I think at any period of our life, if we are looking for a relationship as a solution to some of the our personal problems, we may or may not get hurt by that relationship right? So I know a lot of people who have an amazing relationship that is not abusive and they didn't know the person very well. They were really insecure, et cetera, et cetera. It's just kind of a crapshoot, right? Right. So telling a victim like this is your fault because you didn't get all the way healed. mm, Not a great idea in my opinion, but saying in order to be the healthiest person that you can, if you really do want a relationship, what is it that you're looking for? What are the things that you feel like you're lacking? And are you wanting a relationship to fill those needs? So for me at this point in my life, I'm not super interested in sex. Financially, I am stable. So I'm not super worried about that. I have lots of friends. I feel completely fulfilled in terms of social things. I'm an introvert. So that's not that hard to do. The only thing I'm really genuinely lacking right this very second, I would say is... (laughs) my ability to organize meal plans. So I I say that because I think, man, if I could find a man who would help me cook, 
right? I want someone to help me clean. I don't mind cooking, but clean all my my dishes up. Right, 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 right. And, <laughs> and, and the last thing I thought you were going to say. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> That's why I'm laughing. <laughs> Oh yeah, I have such a hard time like meal planning and cooking <laughs> I, meals. So yeah, so with, that's cool. With, with that, I I you know if I think oh like a relationship would be so great if you know he could cook or something. I know that sounds crazy. <laughs> yeah, no, that I just wasn't expecting it. That's all. But other than that, I'm like nah, I'm fine. So the other <laughs> issue is at that point where you determine okay, what would I want a relationship for? right? Um, companionship or I want to travel or, you know, I don't know, go to movies, something right? right. like yeah. in, can you, instead of looking for a relationship to do that, can you find other ways to do that? Girlfriends, a meal planning service where they ship <laughs> the meal to your house, right? I've done if, that for sure. Someone who's a cleaning, uh, maybe you could hire a teenager in your neighborhood to come help you clean or whatever. Like how can you get these needs met? without a relationship. Like that's one, I would say that is the first step to beginning to trust again. And I know that sounds weird. And it's because you don't want to enter a relationship with something that you need. Right. Yes. Right. Right. Because a narcissist is always going to groom you through your, your really deep needs. So if you really deeply need someone to understand you, a narcissist is going to groom you by acting like he truly understands you. If you really need someone to help you organize your time, let's say you're really, you know, like that's something that you need help with. He is going to groom you by being like, Hey, let me help you. Let me set the alarm for you. And I'll wake you up in the morning and, you know, I'll call you when you're supposed to do something and you'll feel like you've met your soulmate. And so to eliminate this grooming thing, like think about the things that you are looking for and then try to meet them in other ways. I would say that is the first step. You're too vulnerable as an abuse victim to try and build another relationship when you have these deep needs that you haven't figured out how to solve on your own. So I'd say that's the first thing. That's what he said on our last podcast too. Your soul has to go from dependence to independence before you can do anything else. It's the same thing. So yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, that's good. And then I think I feel like I trust way more than I did when I was in my relationship, even before I understood I was being abused. Now I have some amazing men in my life that they're, they're like my friend's husbands, for example, or my uncle or my father or my brother or whatever, who are amazing and they're non-abusive and they are supportive and helpful to me. And I'm really grateful. So trust in my life in general has increased dramatically. And I'm talking about trust for just other people, right? Trust for my friends. I have more trust in my friends. I have more trust that they've got my back. So that's, I would say the second place is start building trust in non-romantic relationships, right? right? Right. Start building it that way. So you feel like you have a strong support network that can help you. And then if if you're ready to start perhaps considering a romantic relationship, then just slowly building that brick by brick over time and taking your time to do that, knowing that you have all the time in the world, right? There is no hurry in this thing. Narcissists are always going to want to speed up that process and Mm -hmm. they are going to want to get into a very serious relationship very quickly. So that would be a red flag to you to kind of be able to slow things down. I think maybe the only exception to this rule might be with someone, let's say you've got a a really good man friend who let's say his wife has been your friend too for 40 years. So you know him super well, and you've been friends since high school or something. And then his wife dies or something. Right. And then you're like, Oh, I've known this person for a long time. Still, even in that case, are you going to want to get married two months after his wife dies? Uh, no, yeah. right. You can still take some time. So I think just taking time is what time is the only way that you can see whether or not someone is abusive or not, because you cannot trust an abuser's words. And so time allows you to view and observe their actions. And that's what's important. Yeah. Well, I think that's excellent advice. Cause I, I totally, cause I do feel like I'm at the point where I'm ready for a relationship, but I, I'm not looking for someone to complete me. Like I know I'm complete and I didn't feel that way before I entered a narcissistic relationship, but 
I totally get that now. I don't think we should be looking for someone to complete us. It's like that whole Jerry Maguire thing. Mm -hmm. No, (laughs) you know, she's like, oh, you complete me. It's like, no, (laughs) we don't need someone to complete us. We're complete. Mm -hmm. So I think that's excellent advice. Um, I put up the walls to protect myself from getting hurt again. Then I knew it was unhealthy. So I tried letting the walls down with some male friends only to get hurt again. This happened maybe three times. But after listening to your podcast, I realized I should have let the wall down more slowly so that they could earn my trust to not just let the wall down blindly. And as you say in the podcast, instantly. But like what you say in the podcast, how you only knew your ex-husband for five months before you married him, and you kind of had that instant trust, which you found is not always the best plan. It is better to rebuild trust slowly, brick by brick. Instead, you're taking the path of learning to trust yourself, and maybe you're going to slowly dip your foot in. You mentioned wanting to experience little bits of getting to know someone. Have you taken any steps towards that? We just asked you that, but have you taken any steps towards that in a romantic way yet? Learning to trust again? You know, I'm not really interested in dating at all. So I have actually started to do this, but in a very weird way. So because I'm not interested in dating and I don't really want a relationship right now, I have hired a matchmaker. <laughs> Sounds crazy. Oh. Um, and so the point of it is not to date per se. And it's also not to get me a boyfriend or anything like that. The point is to be able to have practice conversations with men who are available. Mm-hmm. So I've only done one so far, so I don't know how the rest of them are going to be, but we sat and we ate dinner and I told him I didn't care if I ever wanted to have sex again or not, which he promptly told me was a terrible thing to tell someone on a date. And I told him, (laughs) I don't really care because I don't care. Like, I think he was trying to get me to like back off or whatever. And I'm like, well, I just told you, I don't really care. And he was like, well, I'm just not really turned on by that. And I was like, Great. (laughs) So we were kind of at an impasse. He also said, um, you know, this is not a good marketing strategy for you. And I said, well, since I'm not trying to sell anything, it doesn't really matter, does it? He was very confused, by the way. He was very confused. Anyway, and I told him the purpose of me being here (laughs) is just to learn how to talk to a man who is available. That is all. But I don't actually necessarily want to go out with you again or impress you or anything. So I don't. So you telling me that what I'm saying is inappropriate is kind of like, okay, fine. Bye. (laughs) You know, like uh, whatever. So I thought that was interesting. So that's the steps I'm taking right now. Not necessarily because I want a relationship, but just because I feel like being able to speak with a man who is available is probably a good skill to sort of keep up. Yeah. Um, but not right. because I'm like actively interested in a relationship. So that's the step I'm taking right now. I think it's a good step. Um, my family and my friends, they have mixed feelings about it. They're sort of like, okay, you're weird. If you don't want a relationship, <laughs> why are you going on dates? And then some of them are like, oh, what a good idea. Like, it's good to just practice talking to someone. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that's how I'm, I don't know if I'd say like dip my foot in per se, although maybe it is. I think it's more of a, just something to do um, yeah. <laughs> when my kids are gone, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I've been kind of doing that. Well, I haven't had a date in a while, but I, the few dates I went on on this year or last year, yes, it was. Um, that, that's what I looked at it. Like, I just looked at it like, I'm just having a conversation, getting to know, you know, like you're saying, it's good to kind of just have that practice of having conversation with a, a male. And, you know, and I felt like it was pleasant because I wasn't looking for, I didn't go on the date thinking, well, maybe he's the one or anything. It was just like, I'm getting to go on, getting to talk to this person. And we had really good conversation. You know, we didn't have a date after that because it just wasn't going to work out, but it was, I felt like that it was a good experience. So I think that's mm-hmm. a good approach. Like well, and the reason why I decided with the matchmaker is because I thought I want like, let's say a blind date every two months or something. Let's just pretend for a second. And that's about what's been happening. Like I've only had one and I think that's what will happen. It'll probably be every one or two months that I yeah. do this. But the other issue is I didn't want to have to like ask my friends and family like, Hey, I don't really want to date, but if there's someone you could set me up with for just for practice, please do. Cause then <laughs> I don't really want to do that. And then secondly, <laughs> well. like trying to find a date maybe online for practice seemed problematic. So right, yeah. I, I decided this is a way that I don't even have to know anything about this person. 
can show <laughs> up. Uh, hopefully not necessarily offend them per se, and then just go on my <laughs> merry way. And it's it's good. So that was sort of how I wanted to do it. And the cool thing is women, you can be really creative about the skills that you want to learn or about the things that you want to decide to like yeah. for, for me, like I like paddle boarding, I like skiing, and I apparently like going to dinner with a man I don't know. <laughs> In order to say whatever I want once every two months. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, That would be really nice, actually. Yeah, I think that's actually a great idea. I never thought of that. (laughs) Yeah. So I did want to add something else in. Um, What I really, really, something that helped me so much in my healing and learning to trust again was the person's words, their actions need to match. Mm -hmm. So to see if a person is trustworthy, does what they say and what they do match over a long period of time? Mm-hmm. And what mm-hmm. really struck me was it's after a long period of time. Mm-hmm. So they can't, it can't, you know, that maybe at the beginning they do what they say, but it has to be a long period of time, which reminded me of the brick by brick by brick. Mm-hmm. And there were a few experiences I have with friends that were red flags. And I'll just briefly tell you what I learned. And if you want to add anything yeah. to it, I'll just go over the three. Because a person's nice or kind, or a man's nice or kind, doesn't make him, doesn't equal trustworthy. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's one thing yes. I definitely learned. The second one was if he keeps talking nonstop about how great of a person and how nice he is and doesn't back it up with his actions, which I straight out, I'm kind of like you. I just said, that's great that you're all these things, but I want to see it in action. And he couldn't prove it, prove mm-hmm. himself. And then the third thing is, is they, they tend to not want to respect your boundaries. Anyway, so uh, let's finish with that third thought. I was on a roll. Yeah, you were. And I think you guys will have a lot to add to this one. So they don't respect your boundaries. And it's just like something even just simple. And when you just start talking to someone, even if it's a, as a, a male friend, like I don't give out my phone number. I don't have that trust level yet to give them my actual phone number, but I'll say, you know, I'll, I'll talk to you on messenger as, as friend, a friend, that's it. And then every once in a while, they'll still try to sneak in that. It's almost disrespectful to me. Like, I feel like it's crossing a boundary with me. So I don't know if you guys agree with the boundary thing or um, if you mm-hmm. have any examples of that or want to add anything. I know early on when I did online dating, you know, you know about it, Brenda, as I told you all about <laughs> it, that I felt like I definitely, I definitely feel like he pushed my boundaries. He wanted to get, I mean, he was telling me he loved me and we hadn't even met, you know, it was like, and I would verbalize that, like, you can't love me when you haven't even met me, you know, and, but he kind of kept pushing back on that. And that should have been a red flag, but I was kind of, you know, he was really attractive <laughs> and <you> know, <laughs> he was really cute. And I just kind of was like, you know, I was flattered. So I'm like, wow, he's really interested in me. But then I'm like, wait a minute, this isn't legit though, because it's not genuine. So, I mean, you know, he doesn't really know me first off. So it was more like flattery. And then it was that red flag of like, this is not, <laughs> this is not a healthy relationship. And I did end it, but it, I think we were like, communicating way too long because I should have cut it off a lot sooner because of those, like you were saying, those red flags of like, he, I would tell him, I don't feel comfortable you telling me that. And he still would say it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, mm-hmm. you know, that was very uncomfortable. Speaking of grooming or coercion or manipulation, I think the putting up walls thing is actually one of the basic ways that an abusive man manipulates someone. So, so for example, you might say, Hey, I don't want to give you my phone number or something or whatever. And they might say, well, you, you just put up too many walls. You're not going to be able to let somebody in something like that. Oh, someone did say that to me. That's why I started letting them down. But then Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would just let them down because I didn't understand. Oh, they need to build that trust. They need to show with their actions. But once I heard that they need to show it with their actions, I started like writing it down, like, and writing the thing like when they didn't follow through. Yeah. Like I would ask them to do something and they'd say they do it and then they didn't do it. I started like keeping track of that. And I think uh-huh. a lot of women fall into that trap where mm-hmm. their mind becomes warped because they want, they they're lonely and they want the attention and it just feels good to have that attention yeah. that they're getting. But you really have to use a different part of your brain on this one and go, mm-hmm. wait a minute, this isn't what happening. He's talking to 15 other women. He's, sleeping with two other women or whatever they're doing. Yeah. You have to see the facts and go, no, no. Mm -hmm. And and that's what I would say is a red flag in and of itself. If someone tells you, 
hey, it's okay to trust again. I'm trustworthy. Mm-hmm. Mm. You you've built up these walls and don't you know as part of healing you need to let down some of the walls? I mean, that in and of itself is a red flag, is what I'm trying to yeah. say. Yeah. No, if I- someone says that to you, now this isn't your friend, right? This isn't a friend who has nothing to gain. I'm t- I'm talking about the person who has something to gain from you letting down your wall. So I don't even think victims need to worry about walls per se. Like if they're in this stage where they feel like they need them, great. Like Mm -hmm. what's wrong with that? Right. Right. And if you are keeping people away from you also great, what's wrong with that? Like, do you have a best friend? Do you have a mom or a, a sister or a daughter or, you know, people in your life that you let in? If you do, great. You haven't put walls up. What are you talking about? Right. The it's totally normal to be like, you know, you can't just, it's not. That is so that good right there. What you just said, you're just yeah. putting up walls to protect yourself from the wrong people. Yeah. And so Brenda and Karen, you guys are friends. You've got each other. You're not putting yeah. up walls toward right. each other. You're not right. like isolated from anything. So if a person who has something to gain from you trusting them too soon is telling you, Hey, you have these walls and you need to put them down in order to let someone love you again or whatever, like red flag. Yeah. Yeah, You're like, no, I I have these other people that love me. It's fine. Bye-bye. I think the second thing about boundaries that is really good is you don't have to say them. To be continued. Stay tuned for next week's part two of Learning to Trust Again with Anne Blythe from Betrayal Trauma Recovery. You don't want to miss it. Thanks for tuning in to Hanging on to Hope. Check out our website, hangingontohope.org. There are resources on there, and if you would like to donate or volunteer, you can do that through our website. We are a brand new nonprofit, so we appreciate any and all support. And we thank you for listening, and until next time, keep hanging on to hope. We are evidence that there is hope and healing for you, and our passion is to help you find it too. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening, everyone.